We'll get started. Um, my name is Susan Jakobowitz. I'm an associate professor in the English department here at Queensborough Community College. Um, I want to take this opportunity to welcome everyone to the first event in the 2016-2017 Colloquia series entitled Fleeing Genocide, Displacement, Exile, and the Refugee. I want to thank the faculty coordinators, Eliza Attic, Kathleen Alves, and Myrna Lekic. We're grateful to Dan Lesham and Marissa Hollywood at the Kupferberg Center for all of the support they give to faculty and students who are involved in teaching, studying, and trying to understand the Holocaust. I feel the topic of the colloquia series this year couldn't be more relevant. As we witness and grapple with the worst humanitarian crisis of our time, 65 million displaced people, the largest number of refugees since the end of World War II. We know some of their names and some of their stories. We were awed by the story of Yusra Mardini, a young Syrian swimmer who jumped into the Aegean Sea along with her sister when a motor failed on their dinghy and swam for three hours to push 18 people who could not swim to Lesbos and to safety. She was one of 10 athletes who competed on a refugee team during the Olympics this summer. And the world was transfixed with horror when the lifeless body of Alan Kurdi, a three-year-old Syrian toddler, washed up onto the shore of a Turkish beach. On the same day, Abdullah Kurdi, Alan's father, also lost his son Galib and his wife Rahana. But so many refugees and victims remain nameless. We see pictures or hear stories of hordes of people who are desperate, exhausted, and hopeless. We imagine ourselves in their places. We see the armed guards and barbed wire that confront the families and individuals who attempt to flee. We witness the political backlash against refugees and the prejudice, persecution, and suspicion leveled against them. Just yesterday, Donald Trump's son suggested that refugees were the equivalent of poisonous Skittles. We see these things and they cannot help but remind us of the past, in some cases, our own past. My father set sail for New York from Bremen, Germany, alone, on the SS Marine Marlin on December 9, 1946. He was 17 years old, an orphan, and a child survivor of the Holocaust. One of the most difficult aspects of the Holocaust is the enormity of the numbers we struggle to comprehend. When we are contemplating the fates of whole communities and victims in the thousands and even millions, individuals and families tend to get lost in the mind-numbing statistics. Often we have access only to ghastly graphic photographs we want and need to know who people were. We need to know about their hopes and dreams in order to restore to victims their personhood. There is no ship that haunts our imagination more than the St. Louis, setting off with its almost 1,000 passengers, Jews fleeing the Third Reich, attempting to escape the destruction that seemed imminent at the last possible moment, 1939, when such a thing seemed still possible to come so close to safety and salvation while ultimately being forced to sail back to Europe and catastrophe reinforces the plight, hardship, and the heartbreak of the refugee. It seems like a story we study to reassure ourselves that such cruelty should never be perpetrated on ordinary people ever again, or at least not on our watch. That makes it a story of challenge, a crucial chapter of history, especially in the light of the global crisis that is unfolding now. Today's event is entitled Refuge Denied, St. Louis Passengers and the Holocaust. Dr. Scott Miller, the Director of Curatorial Affairs at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, is with us to discuss his extraordinary book, co-authored with Sarah Ogilvy, that explores the fate of the passengers on the St. Louis. Through painstaking research that took many years and many miles to accomplish, Dr. Miller has unraveled a mystery and restored to humanity these people who were thought to be almost untraceable and unknowable beyond being victims of a terrible fate. It has never been more important to understand that refugees are not a nameless, faceless mass of people, but fathers and mothers, grandparents, aunts and uncles, nieces and nephews, siblings and children. In some instances, they are our families. In all instances, they are like us. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Miller. Um, thank you. Can you hear me? It's okay. Great. Um, so it's really wonderful to be here. Um, this is my second time speaking at Queensboro Community College. I want to thank the um, everyone who invited me, especially uh, the uh, Coverberg Center. And um, but this time, when I, I when I spoke here a year ago, we spoke in the center. But now it's such a big crowd, we've moved 
here, so this is great. And it's wonderful to be participating in a, a series about fleeing genocide um, and the refugee crisis. The Holocaust, of course, mainly was a, the systematic murder or extermination, to use Nazi language, of an entire people. But in addition to the mass murder, it was one of the greatest refugee crises in history. And that's where the United States comes into the picture in terms of being a, uh, what the United States did to try to, to help or, or, or not help. And that's what makes the story of the St. Louis uh, so timely today. Um, people talk about the Holocaust receding in history and it's losing its value, but unfortunately it's gaining value. I wish I could say it wasn't so relevant, but unfortunately it's proving to be uh, extremely relevant. So with that in mind, I'm going to um, speak about the uh, St. Louis. And I'm really here to tell you the story of the uh, ship, the St. Louis, and some of the passengers. And I would just like to start by saying one of the passengers of the St. Louis is here today. She's sitting in, in, the, in the front row, Jane Klebel. Uh, Jane lives in Queens and, in fact, volunteers here at the um, Kupferberg Center, at the Holocaust Resource Center. So afterwards, if there are questions about the journey, about the ship, I wasn't on it, but Jane was, so she'll be able to answer questions either during the Q&A or afterwards informally, however you'd want, she'll, uh, she'll, she, she will be here. So um, I'm here to tell the story of the St. Louis, but also talk about an unsolved mystery that hovered over America for 50, 60 years, and that is whatever became of the passengers who sailed on the St. Louis one by one by one. When we look at the news today and we learn about the refugee crisis in Europe, uh, it's not about mass numbers. We, it's often focusing you know, on, on, on one refugee who jumped ship, who maybe made it or maybe drowned. They're individual stories. So we wanted to know, we at the Holocaust Museum in Washington, and by a show of hands, I'm just curious, how many of you have been to the Holocaust Museum in Washington? Where I, oh, wow. That's fantastic. So we had, we at the Holocaust Museum, we had some unfinished business with this story. We wanted to know what happened to all 937 passengers who sailed on the St. Louis. We wanted to know for a variety of reasons. One, as I indicated just now, history is about individual stories. And in the case of the St. Louis, there were 937 passengers. So the St. Louis wasn't just one story which I'll tell you that story in a second, but it was 937 individual stories. And there are, we wanted to show that there are consequences to a less than generous refugee policy in a time of crisis. So in the case of the St. Louis with 937 passengers, there were 937 uh, consequences to the ship uh, being denied entry into the United States. We also, um, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, for those of you who have been there, you know it's on the mall in Washington. And um, the story of the St. Louis is the place really where Holocaust history and American history intersect. The story of the St. Louis, as you'll learn in the next few minutes, is a much about us, as much about us and American policy and refugee policy as it is about the Holocaust. So we felt that the, uh, being the nation's national memorial to the victims of the Holocaust in Washington, we had an obligation to uh, tell this story. We also wanted to tell it because it was timely. We did this project in the 1990s. It's more timely now as time goes on. And the other reason we wanted to do this project to trace the fate of all the passengers was simply the challenge, was simply the thrill of the chase, the challenge. Could we find out what happened to all 937 passengers on the St. Louis? But first, let me tell you the uh, story of the uh, St. Louis. This ship sa set sail from uh, Hamburg, Germany on May 13th, 1939. And almost all the passengers on the St. Louis were Jewish refugees leaving, leaving Nazi Germany, fleeing Nazi Germany, fleeing uh, for their lives. We're already now six months after Kristallnacht, November 1938, which was the burning of synagogues throughout Germany and Austria. Uh, that is somewhat of a, of a warning, of a wake-up sign that it's time to leave. Imagine in the United States if, that, if something, like that, uh, something like that happened, and they were not isolated events. It was the burning of synagogues throughout Germany. Um, so at, at this point in uh, German-Jewish history, there was a real desperation to leave. 
uh, on behalf on the part of the Jewish community. The problem, of course, was that there was really not there were not that many places to go. The United States, in particular, which was the desired destination of most of the Ger Jews trying to leave Germany, had a very strict refugee policy. Uh, there was, uh, based on, if you know American history, the 1924 immigration laws in the United States that limited immigrants by nationality. And for Germany, the quota for Germany, which was higher than many other countries, uh, was uh, 27,330 in the year 1939. And by the time the St. Louis set sail in May, the, that quota was already filled. So to leave Germany, what, uh, the Jew what uh, Jewish refugees did is they got what was called a waiting number to get into the United States. They got that from their local American consulate. So on one hand, they boarded the ship with a waiting number. And what they had also was a temporary landing permit to stay in Havana, to stay in Cuba since their, uh, until their waiting number came up. So the St. Louis was a Cuba-bound, a Havana-bound boat. The idea was that they would wait in Havana as I said, till their number came up, and then they'd go to the United States, be it a year later, two, two years later, three years later. Havana was a much better place to be than Berlin, than Germany for Jews in 1939. And those who were sailing on the St. Louis were considered the lucky ones because they were going to be so close to the United States. So once their number came up, they could just take a boat or fly to the United States. And in those days, it was a lot easier going uh, traveling between Cuba and the United States than it is uh, today. Now maybe it might change, given the events of the last year. Uh, but in those days, again, you could go back and forth. So the St. Louis passengers were, as I said, considered the lucky ones. Because at that point, Jews were leaving Germany to take refuge in Shanghai, in South America, in Japan, in, in, in the inner depths of Russia, anywhere but Germany. And again, Havana was just so close to the United States. The St. Louis was a cruise line. It was part of the Hamburg America line. And you could even see that um, on the, uh, as, as the passengers board. And the passengers thought, of course, that they were going to um, freedom. And on the St. Louis, first of all, for the kids on the St. Louis, the kids just had uh, the time of the li their lives. I see Jane looking at the photo. I don't know if she recognizes, because Jane was a child uh, also uh, on board the St. Louis. Uh, some of these kids that you see in front of you survived the war, and some of them uh, did not. But it wasn't just, a fun, uh, just fun for kids. It was fun for adults as well. There was parties on board the St. Louis. There was, um, what do you call it? roller skating on board the St. Louis. There was a pool. Uh, there was shuffleboard. The, there was relative calm on board the ship because the passengers thought they were going, as I said, uh, to freedom. Of course, it was bittersweet. Why bitter? Because most of the passengers, their families had lived in Germany for gen generations. They felt at home, and they were being kicked out of their home. On the other hand, it was sweet because they were going to freedom, or so they thought. So the St. Louis arrives in the port of Havana on uh, May 27th, exactly two weeks from the day they set sail. And um, they were greeted by um, a Cuban, uh, Cuban police who told, at first, they were not allowed to disembark, but they were told manana, they would be able to disembark. And for many of the passengers, that was the first Spanish word they learned, uh, manana. But as one, of, as one of the passengers said, manana never came. There was no tomorrow, because they were not allowed to disembark. Their Cuban uh, landing permits were uh, declared to be invalid. And uh, till this day, we don't know the exact reason why they were invalidated. Those, uh, those same permits had worked for approximately 2,500 other Jews who had gotten to Havana before the St. Louis and found refuge there. And in fact, where's Mr. Samuel? I met earlier, was one of them. He and his family were arrived in Havana uh, a few months before the St. Louis and eventually made their way to the United States. Mr. Samuel told me that he remembers the St. Louis coming to Havana and that his father actually went down uh, to the port because his father had an uncle who was on board uh, the St. Louis. So what you see in front of you is a picture of members of the Jewish community in Havana who had relatives on the St. Louis who rented the, these little boats and sailed out to the St. Louis to try to give their relatives encouragement that maybe, maybe manana they will be able to get off the ship. And 
they were not allowed to get on the St. Louis, they were only allowed to wave. And what you see now is a mirror image of the St. Louis passengers on board looking at their relatives in these little ships. And for many of them, this would be the last time they would ever see their relatives alive because in fact, the St. Louis was not able, the passengers were not able to disembark. I was in Cuba uh, around 15 years ago and I did research at the National Archives to try, of Cuba, of Havana, to try to figure out why the St. Louis passengers uh, could not leave, uh, why they could not disembark. Every ship that landed in Cuba had a file at the archives in, in Havana. The St. Louis file, they said, was missing, and that's what I was told. We do know, though, that there was a corrupt Cuban consular official in Germany that was selling these landing permits for, and pocketing the money himself. So many people speculate that the St. Louis passengers fell prey, they fell uh, like sacrifice to the um, inner fighting in the Cuban government. This was a way of the Cuban government saying to this corrupt Cuban uh, consular official in Germany, whose name was Benitez, Manuel Benitez, Benitez, we know what you're doing. We're not going to, uh, we're going to invalidate your landing permits. But of course, who suffered from, by that was the St. Louis passengers uh, themselves. Uh, so at this point, as you can imagine, uh, mass panic broke out on the ship. The American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee tried to broker a deal with the Cuban government to allow the passengers to disembark. The, uh, the deal fell through. Uh, two side events you should know about. There were 22 Jewish passengers out of the 937 who were allowed to disembark in Cuba because back in Germany, they uh, had a s sneaking suspicion that, you know, something could happen to these landing permits and they actually bought for a lot of money actual Cuban visas that were signed by the Cuban Secretary of the State and Secretary of the Treasury. They were allowed to disembark and there was one passenger named Max Lowe who was so panicked about going back to uh, Germany that he slit his wrist and jumped ship. And he was actually rescued by Cuban, uh, by Cuban sailors and was put in a hospital in Havana. He had a wife and daughter on the St. Louis who were not able to get off the ship with him to go to the uh, hospital. Um, and by the way, Max Lowe was already limping on the St. Louis because he had been beaten up around eight months earlier in the Buchenwald camp and ironically was released from Buchenwald because his wife uh, let the camp official know, he, they, his wife let the camp officials know that he actually had a uh, a ticket on the ship to St. Louis and they, they let him out of Buchenwald, ironically. He also was limping because he sustained war injuries fighting for his homeland, Germany, in World War I. So he was not going to go back. He slid his wrist and jumped ship. The St. Louis, then uh, the captain of the St. Louis, whose name was Captain Gustav Schroeder, who really cared about the passengers uh, and, in fact, uh, instructed his crew that these uh, the passengers on the St. Louis, though they're Jewish, they're also German, and they're to be treated like any other German, which was an extraordinary thing to be said in Germany in 1939. Uh, and in fact, he set up makeshift synagogue in one of the ballrooms for the uh, passengers and ordered that the portraits of Hitler and the swastikas be taken down. So that's something very extraordinary. So Captain Schroeder, of course, did not want to take the ship back to, um, back to Germany, so he sailed slowly uh, to the coast of Miami Beach and came so tantalizingly close to the uh, shores of Miami Beach that the passengers could see the hotels and the palm trees. And it was the hope that the United States would let in the passengers, not only because it's the United States and the country of the Statue of Liberty, but based on the bureaucratic technicality that over 700 of the 937 passengers actually had a waiting number to get into the United States. It was just a matter of letting them in early. So these passengers, though they were refugees, they were refugees with paperwork. And uh, they weren't even today what we call boat people. They were people on a boat, but they were actually not boat people. They had papers to get into the United States. It was a matter of letting them in early. And the um, and as the ship sailed off the coast of Miami Beach, it was actually headlines in the United States and all the major newspapers in the United States of the ship languishing off the coast of Miami Beach. People who were old enough at the time remember the story of the St. Louis because it got so much publicity. And the passengers actually cabled uh, President Roosevelt and also the State Department asking for entry into the United States based on the fact that they had waiting numbers to get into the United States. 
And uh, as far as we know, they were, uh, never heard back from the White House. They did hear back from the visa division of the State Department, uh, and they were told that uh, even though they had waiting numbers, the passengers would have to, quote, wait their turn and leave American shores. So after coming, as I said, so tantalizingly close to the shores of the United States, the ship had to sail back to Europe. And then, as you can imagine, mass panic seized the passengers. There were threats of mass suicides. Uh, fortunately, in the short run, through the intervention of the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, the JDC, a deal was brokered with four Western European countries other than Germany to take in the passengers, France, Belgium, Holland, and England. So on June 17, 1939, the passengers happily did not have to disembark in Hamburg. They disembarked in Antwerp in Belgium and were divided between those four countries. So at the time, that was considered the happy ending to the story. But of course, with history, hist our historical knowledge, which is hindsight's 2020, we know that wasn't a happy ending to the story. Because three of those four countries, Belgium, France, and Holland in 1940, were invaded by the Nazis. So to be a Jew in any one of those countries was for the all intents and purposes the same as being a Jew in Germany. So the St. Louis passengers, you could say, were double-crossed. Both literally, they had a double-cross the ocean, but figuratively, they were double-crossed. They thought they were going to freedom in Havana and the United States, and they end up under the clutches of the Nazis once again. So the story that I told you the, the, just now, a very famous refugee story, um, as I said, is known to many people. And for those of you who study uh, either American history or Holocaust history, you may know this story. But again, uh, refugee stories and refugee crises are not about ships, they're about people. And what people did not know is really what became of the passengers, the people you see in front of you now, once the ship got back to Europe. And that is where um, our project of the Holocaust began, to retell this story as a real refugee story through personal stories, what became of the missing passengers on the St. Louis. And um, of course, all history projects begin with documents. And I want to stress we did this project, again, in the dark ages of the 1990s, before a lot of the internet existed, believe it or not. Um, we, had to, um, we were dependent on good old-fashioned paper. We had in our archives at the Holocaust Museum uh, a number of the shipping manifests and lists of the names of the passengers on the St. Louis. So fortunately, we, we knew their names. And this was, a, what you see in front of you is a list that was put together by the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee and had a list of every passenger, when they were born, how old they were in the St. Louis, and what country they were sent to, Belgium, England, France, or Holland. So at least we had that much minimal information. And um, then we went and looked at um, a deportation lists that we had at, in the Holocaust Museum in our archive. And, um, it's, and the deportation list, a lot of them are very, it's very basic information. Some of it is hardcover books and that might even be here at Queensboro at the Holocaust Resource Center. And we were able to find the names of uh, over 200 St. Louis passengers who were uh, deported to Auschwitz and Sobibor and presumably gassed. And again, to see the name of somebody that you knew was off the coast of Miami Beach to be on a deportation list it was something shot every single time we saw the name. It was, it, it shocked us. And then we walked across the mall in Washington to the National Archives. I'm sure many of you have been there and done your own family research. Uh, I presume everyone in this room is a child of an immigrant, if not an immigrant, um, or grandchild of an immigrant, um, as am I. We found the names of a couple of St. Louis passengers who were able to make their way into the United States. We found their immigration record either during the war or after the war. So we thought um, once we added up the names of those who survived with those we found on the deportation lists, we would come up to the number 937 or close to it, which was the, name, the number of St. Louis passengers. But in fact, we uh, fell short. There were around 250 missing St. Louis passengers, or unaccounted for St. Louis passengers, whose names appeared neither on the deportation lists. And I want to uh, just add that uh, at the Holocaust Museum, in addition to the deportation list, we also have a number of photographs of families who were deported. This is an entire family 
uh, that was on the St. Louis, two brothers, Ernest and Willie Dublon and their family, uh, and we found every one of their names on the uh, deportation list. They were all deported from Belgium to Auschwitz uh, and killed, and you see the little girl in the middle, that's Laurie Dublon, she was maybe like seven years old. Um, here she is, she's one of the clowns sitting on, uh, this was actually a, um, sort of a class party in her town in Erfurt, Germany. And so when I said that we did research on deportation lists, we also, for many of the passengers, were able to, have, to get photos. So we felt like we knew these people. And they were, again, off the coast of Miami Beach. And then we find their name on a deportation list. Uh, so when we, again, we added the deportation list to the, name of the to the names on the immigration list. But we, st we fell around 250 passengers short. So at that point, we knew that we had to change the way we are, our whole strategy in looking for the St. Louis passengers. We couldn't just depend on documents, on paper. We had to depend on people. We knew there were people out there in the entire, throughout the world who could tell us what happened to the missing St. Louis passengers. It was just a matter of finding them. And often when I speak to school groups, to junior high school groups, to high school groups, and I ask, so if you want to reach as many people as possible, to find out in the shortest amount of time, to find out what happened to people 60 years ago, what do you do? So every hand is raised and they say, well, go to Facebook, <laughs> go to Twitter and my app and this, things I haven't, even, I haven't even heard of. And I have to explain that in the dark ages of the 1990s, there was barely email, believe it or not. None of this existed when we did this project. So we had to do it the old fashioned way and that was going to the media. And when I say media, I don't mean social media, I mean like the real media, like newspapers and radio. And in fact, that's what Holocaust survivors did after the war. There wasn't yet television, but there was a newspaper and there was radios and people put ads in newspaper, Holocaust survivors in search of relatives. That's how they found relatives, believe it or not. So we had to do the same thing in the 1990s. We put um, ads in newspapers around the world. Um, saying um, that we were in search of the missing St. Louis passengers and just hoping and then praying people would contact us. We were also um, on television and on the radio. And in fact, the Holocaust Museum sent me to do media training to be able to talk about this. And I remember the, 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 the first thing they told me is don't speak with your hands when you're on television. <laughs> so, um, which was very, very uh, difficult. But again, most of the search was on the newspaper, was in newspaper, so we didn't have to worry about that. And the very first ad that we put uh, that we put was in a small newspaper in Israel called Israel Nachrichten, which is a German language paper in Israel. Remember, most of the St. Louis passengers were German Jews. This is a German Jewish saga. We published in this small newspaper in Israel. We pu the ad was published in German, Hebrew, and English saying, in search of the missing St. Louis passengers, we listed the missing passengers and asked if anybody has information, please contact Scott Miller. And it gave my phone, fax, and email address in Washington, DC. <coughs> and among the passengers, the, the missing passengers we were looking for was a family of three. The last name was Fink. The father's name was Monford Fink. The mother's name was Herta Fink. And they had a five-year-old little boy named Michael Fink. And we always wondered what happened to the Fink family because of this five-year-old little boy. There was just, we had a paper trail of evidence showing that when the St. Louis passengers were sent back to Europe, the Finks were among those sent to Holland. In Holland, they were interned in a camp called Westerbork. And from there, they were deported to Theresienstadt in 1942. But the clues ended cold. There was no documentation that they lived or that they survived, this five-year-old little, five-year-old little boy. Uh, Michael Fink. Anyway, I get to work the day the ad is published, and I really am very skeptical. Skeptical. I was trained as a historian about putting an ad in a newspaper. And I'm going through new, uh, emails, and I see an email that says, Dear Mr. Miller, my name today is Mikhail Barak, but in 1939, on board the St. Louis, my name was Michael Fink. I was five years old. I think you're looking for me. <laughs> so this was uh, the first, you could say, success of this process. I couldn't, I couldn't believe, I, I mean, I couldn't believe it. I just couldn't believe it. And I called him on the phone. Uh, he lives in a suburb of Tel Aviv in Israel. And he said he was expecting my call. And I asked him to tell me his story. And he said, I'll, I'll tell you my story, but two things you should know right away. One, unfortunately, my mother just died a few months ago. 
and she's the one with the memory who could have told the story. He was five years old at the time. And he goes, my father did not survive. My mother and I survived. My father did not survive. And I, in part, hold the United States government responsible for the death of my father. We were off the coast of Miami Beach, and my father ended up dying of a disease on a cattle car to Auschwitz. And his name was never registered. That's why you didn't find his name. But um, how did that happen, that my father was off the coast of Miami Beach and dies on a cattle car to Auschwitz? And it's a question that there is no answer to, obviously. So he and his mother survived. They were liberated at Theresienstadt by the Russians. And then, instead of coming to the United States, they went to Israel, which at the time was under a British mandate. And there was a blockade on immigration. You might be familiar with the story of the Exodus. This is a similar story that happened with him. He went on what was called clandestine immigration to Israel. Uh, which is why there was no record of him going, because it was clandestine. If something's clandestine, there's, there's no record. And then when they got to Israel, they Hebraicized their name from Fink to Barak. They took a new name. So he said, you were looking for the right person, but the wrong name. Michael Fink has not existed since 1948. And um, he donated to the Holocaust Museum the one, collection, the one photo he had of his parents. This was taken while they were in Holland, before they were deported to Vesterbork. That's him in the... In the uh, in the middle, and you, he, he was willing to part with this photo, because the Holocaust Museum you know, obviously can care for this photo and, 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 sh and show it to, to, to millions of people. But you can imagine how painful it was. This was one memory of his father, and he, ga he gave this uh, photo uh, up, up for us. But that's little uh, Michael Barak, who's still alive uh, today, and I see him occasionally um, uh, when I go to Israel. I want to just tell you one more media story that we, uh, how we found the family. And it's, um, it wasn't using the newspaper, it was using the radio. We were an NPR. And I like being on radio more than television because no one sees you so you can talk with your, talk with your hands. And it was uh, Scott Simon on NPR. And he, we only had a few minutes. And he said, we don't have time to read the whole list. Just focus on one story. And we focused on the story of a passenger named uh, Rudy Dingfelder. Rudy Dingfelder and his parents, uh, Johanna and Leopold Dingfelder, were on the St. Louis together. And like the Fink family, when they disembarked in Antwerp, they were sent to Holland. And, but from Holland, instead of being deported to Theresienstadt, they were deported straight to Auschwitz, where his parents were gassed. However, Rudy was not gassed right away, because we found a document at the Holocaust Museum showing he was chosen for forced labor. So maybe he survived as a tool maker. He was chosen for forced, uh, forced labor as a tool maker. Maybe he survived, maybe didn't. Thousands, tens of thousands died in forced labor. It wasn't a guarantee of survival, but we found no record of a Rudy Dinkfelder, either that he was killed or that he uh, survived. Somebody's listening to uh, us tell this story in NPR, and somebody calls from El Paso, Texas, and said he's you know, driving to work, and he hears this uh, you know, piece on the radio, and he goes, I don't know if I could help you. I just know that my wife had a relative who always, they said he survived in Auschwitz as a tool maker. So that was not a lot to go on. And we, for every lead that we got that was a great lead, we would get 10 false leads from people. So we thought this was one of the false leads. But this guy's wife calls us back a few days later and says, look, I had a relative. I didn't know him well. He died maybe 15 years ago who survived at uh, Auschwitz as a tool maker. His name wasn't Rudy Dinkfelder. We called him Robert Felder. Maybe it's the same person, maybe not, but he's not alive anymore. But his widow, Geraldine Felder, is alive. She lives in Detroit. Why don't you call her? She'll be able to tell you. you know, so we call Geraldine Felder on the phone. And you know, we have to be very gentle when you call people about things like you know, trauma like this. And whether it's the right person or the wrong person, we still have to be very gentle. And we said, uh, Mrs. Felder, and she said, yes, we're calling from the Holocaust Museum. And she said, yes. And we said, was your husband Robert Felder? And she said, yes, he was. He died around 15 years ago. And then we said, was your husband, was Robert Felder also Rudy Dinkfelder, who tried to come to America the first time on the St. Louis? And she said, yes, that was my husband. So we're very grateful to this lovely guy who called us from um, who we were very skeptical about from uh, El Paso, Texas. So anyway, we're extremely excited to be talking to her. And she said, we asked, did Rudy ever talk about how he survived at Auschwitz? And she said, yeah, he told two stories. Because I said, you know, his parents were killed. And if they went together, you know, how, how did he, uh, how was he chosen for forced labor? And how did he survive forced labor? She said, Rudy, or she called him Robert. She said, 
Robert said that when the family got to Auschwitz and they were pulled off the train, she said, Robert or Rudy wore glasses and his glasses went flying. So from the force of being pulled off the train. So he thought for sure he'd be sent to the line to be gassed because he was sort of, he had very poor eyesight. He was sort of flailing around. If you looked at all unhealthy, you were sent to be gassed. However, as it turned out, every teenager, he was a teenager at the time, every teenager with glasses was sent to the gas chambers because of the stereotype, you're weaker if you wear glasses. Every teenager without glasses was sent to the line for forced labor. So because his gla glasses flung off, he was sent to the line for forced labor. And then when he was asked at forced labor, do you have a profession? You have to show that you were useful. He had the presence of mind to say he was a tool maker, even though he really was not a tool maker. His parents, his father, in fact, was a kosher butcher in Plau in Germany. He had the presence of mind not to say that and just said, I'm a tool maker. And he survived in Auschwitz uh, as a tool maker. And we have from the Felder family this photo. That's the Dingfelders boarding the ship boarding the St. Louis. There's Rudy in the middle with the glasses. And he was uh, only a teenager at the time. I think he looks older, but I think that's the way people dressed in, in those days. But there's Rudy with the glasses. And um, we have this as well. You might say, this looks like a napkin. This is just a napkin. It is a napkin, but it's a very important document as well that the D Felder family or Ding Felder family gave to us. You see on the top line, it says Leopold Dingfelder. Leopold Dingfelder was Rudy's father. When the ship got to Antwerp and the passengers were being dispersed between the three countries, Holland, Belgium, France, and England, Leopold Dingfelder took a napkin. He didn't even have a piece of paper. He took a napkin from the ship and wrote in German that obviously he's asking to go to England, which you can see the word England, this, the last word of the second line, because his brother, Carl Felder, from Cleveland, Ohio, and you can see he underlines Cleveland, Ohio, is in Germany, is, excuse me, is in England waiting for him. Can we please go to England? And had they been sent to England, that probably would have saved their lives, but instead they were sent to Holland. But this is an important document because it answers the question or attempts to answer the question. How did, how did they determine, uh, how did the immigration officials in Antwerp determine which family go, goes where? And the answer is we don't know. Clearly they were not taking personal uh, uh, requests. Um, but it's still a very, very important um, Holocaust document. So um, now I don't want you to think, oh, we just were on the TV and the radio when we found everybody. It wasn't, of course, uh, that easy. Uh, we went. Uh, back to the cities where the St. Louis passengers were during the war, Antwerp, Belgium, Paris, Holland, looking for clues. We, uh, this is uh, in uh, one of the St. Louis families in Brussels during the war. And in Brussels, believe it or not, the Gestapo, the, the German secret police took a, um, a census of the Jewish population of all Jews in Brussels, and we had their addresses, and in some cases, phone numbers. You don't think of, of the, refugees and having phones, but they did. So I went back to those ad addresses in the 1990s, thinking maybe there's someone in the building who remembers the passengers, remembers what happened to them. And um, these are the old refugee neighborhoods of uh, Saarbrück and Anderlecht in uh, Brussels. And if any of you have been to Brussels, you know that those neighborhoods uh, today are um, neighborhoods of refugees from Arab countries. This is back in the 1990s. Uh, so this was really, there was no really remnant there of any of the original Jewish population from the 1940s. And so I said to myself at that point, you know something, the story of, of Jewish refugees of the 19th century, uh, 20th century, excuse me, is not so much where they went, where they're from, but where they went to. And really you have to focus not so much in Europe, this is because you're talking about a community that was obliterated, but where Jews went to. That was Israel and the United States, the two centers of Jewish population. So I'm going to focus now on what we did in the United States. Um, maybe during Q&A could, you could uh, talk about some of the out, uh, work we did in Israel. We started in this city right here, New York City, the, city where, the great city we're in now, the city I grew up in. And I went to the New York Public Library and you know, I'm sure you're familiar with it, on Fifth Avenue and 42nd Street. And look, they have old New York City telephone books from the 1940s and 1950s. I presume everyone in here knows what a telephone book is, because when I speak <laughs> to younger to students in high school, junior high school, they have no idea what I'm talking about. Books that had the uh, 
addresses and phone numbers of residents of New York City. So we started, I started with Manhattan, going through the phone books, I started looking up names of St. Louis passengers, and I found a lot of names, but I didn't know if they were the same people. They were people with the same names. And some of them were very common, sort of German-Jewish names. But I did notice something that was a clue, a tip off right away. I noticed all the addresses for these German-Jewish names, whether they were the exact people we were looking for or not, were all within about a 40 block radiance, radius excuse me, on the upper, upper west side of Manhattan between around uh, West 180th and 220th Street. And for those of you who know Manhattan, you know that's Washington Heights. For those of you who are maybe 50 and older, you might know, you might remember that Washington Heights was, after World War II, into the 50s and even into the 1960s, the center of German Jewish life outside of Germany. It was the largest, it was a re German Jewish refugee neighborhood. Uh, today it's mostly a Dominican uh, neighborhood, but in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, it was a German Jewish refugee neighborhood. I grew up very close to that neighborhood in the 1960s, and I remember friends of mine whose grandparents were survivor, Holocaust survivors from Germany, their grandparents all lived in that neighborhood. So I said to myself, that's the place to go to look for clues. So I got on the A train, down on 42nd Street, went all the way uptown. I had not been back to that neighborhood since I was a kid, and then I realized right away, well, I don't hear much German. I hear a lot of Spanish. I said to myself, this, this is probably a mistake. Just like in Brussels, the neighborhoods change. That's what refugees, refugee neighborhoods are. Every couple of decades, it's a new neighborhood. Um, but I noticed there was a synagogue still in the neighborhood. And uh, I knocked on the door. It was like a glass door with a bar. And I knocked on the door. An elderly man came to the door wearing a yarmulke and holding a hammer. And, uh, was, and he, he let me in, and I told him I was with the Holocaust Museum. I explained my project, what I was trying to do. And I'll never forget this. He said, if you've come to get information on German Jews, you've come to the right neighborhood. He told me this was in the 1990s. He said there were still about 5,000 Jews left in, German Jews left in the neighborhood. And um, we started looking at old synagogue records that were in shoeboxes written on index cards. And this was, you know, this is, they were written in pencil, it was very difficult to read. But the one thing I remember, first of all, we were able to find the names of a number of St. Louis passengers or their relatives who we were able to contact, who were paying for perpetual care of the graves of, the, of, of their relatives. But what I remember, when you join a synagogue, you say the date of the, if you're saying the Kaddish, the memorial prayer for any relative, you say the date that they died. And so, on these old synagogue membership records for date of death for relatives, every single one had question mark Auschwitz, question mark Sobobor, question mark Berlin. The pain of this synagogue, which was a synagogue of Holocaust survivors, was palpable. Uh, and anyway, um, in the interest of time, I have just a couple of more minutes. I, I, I won't go into detail about Washington Heights, but through Washington Heights, through the synagogues in that neighborhood, and there were still about five synagogues left in the 1990s through synagogue records, through cemetery records, uh, through social service agency, we were able to unravel and discover the fate of dozens of St. Louis passengers, some of whom were still alive and living in uh, the neighborhood. Um, one of whom was the woman second to the left. Um, her name was Ilsa Marcus. She was on the St. Louis with her newlywed husband, her uncle, and, and parents. She was the only one to survive. Even her, she, she joked, she said, oh, the St. Louis was like my honeymoon cruise. And her entire family was killed at Auschwitz. She survived at Auschwitz. I asked her how she survived. She just died a few years ago. She's a very spunky woman in her 90s. She said, well, she worked in an ammunitions factory. And she, she said she booby-trapped the hand grenades to go off on contact. That's what she, she said. And she, but she survived. She lived in Washington Heights. She never remarried. Um, and she said every single night she would go to sleep recounting the story of what happened to her family. This is 50 or 60 years. Uh, that's just one of the uh, people that we found in this um, in incredible neighborhood. And um, also at the Washington Heights Cemetery, which is actually in New Jersey, the Jewish Cemetery in Paramus, New Jersey, we actually found the grave of one of the missing St. Louis passengers. Just to give you an idea of this type of real hands-on community type of research. Everywhere we, I would go in the United States in the, in the 1990s talking about the St. Louis, uh, people would come up to me with information. 
Um, and you see the guy with the, the shades, the, the cool looking guy there. His name is Ernst Weil. Uh, when I was speaking in San Francisco at the San Francisco Public Library in around 1997, an elderly man came up to me that did not look much like the guy in the, with the sunglasses, and he said, my name is Ernst Savile, and he gave me that uh, photograph. And he, um, the girl sticking her tongue out um, actually did not survive. She was, uh, she was deported. In fact, all the women in that, he's the only one um, who was uh, survived in that photo. He asked me, he said, you know, my best buddy, his name was Horst Rotholtz. Horst Rotholtz, we were in a children's home together in France in hiding, the, the home got raided. Uh, I was taken away and survived. I never knew what happened to Horst. He said, everybody knew Horst because Horst always played the harmonica. He got it for a Hanukkah present and always played the harmonica. So we looked at our records, and Horst Rotholz was deported, in fact, in January 1943. We found the deportation record, and we told Ernst, this is what happened to your, be your best friend, Horst. Um, but we were able to obtain this picture from the children's home, and I think you see which one is Horst, the second from the left. He got this as a Hanukkah present in December 1942, and a month later he was um, deported. So um, I'm going to... Um, I have like five more minutes. Um, I think I just for the AV people, I have a video, but I think I'm going to skip the video because the video has a St. Louis passenger on it, but we have one live here, so it's even better than a video. <laughs> just in the, you know, so if there are any questions. So uh, there's, uh, as far as I know, there are two St. Louis passengers living in Queens. One is here, and one is in this photo as an infant on the St. Louis. I believe she was the youngest person on the St. Louis. Her name is Judy. And Judy was on the St. Louis with her parents and grandfather. That's her grandfather holding her. And Judy, um, who lives in Kew Gardens, told me the story that um, her parents, they were together in hiding in France. And her parents knew, obviously, that they were going to be deported. And they wanted to save her, their daughter's life. But you don't tell a child we're giving you away to, you know, with another family to hide you. So she said her, she sort of remembers. She was at the time already four years old. She was walking somewhere with her father. He was holding her hand. And he said, look over there. There was something interesting happening in the distance with a bunch of people. That, was a little, that would be stimulating to a four-year-old. He said, look over there. And he was holding her hand. He let go of her hand. And then she said a minute later, somebody else grabbed her hand. And she looked up. It wasn't her father, but it was a person who another rescuer, a, a Catholic man who took her into hiding for the rest of the war. And um, that saved Judy's life. But of course, Judy never saw, Judy really doesn't remember her parents. Uh, that's Judy on the left with her adopted sister and brother, who she considered to be her real sister and brother during the war. And she said, the wonderful thing about this family is that they never let her forget that she was Jewish. They said, don't tell anybody. And they took her to mass. So for appearance's sake, but they never really tried to convert her. And Judy survived the war, came to the United States, moved to Washington Heights, finished high school in the United States, now lives in Queens, and she stayed in touch with this family throughout the rest of her, until today, throughout the rest of her life. And so it's a nice little local story. So I'm gonna end with this photo, which is a group photo from the St. Louis. So after a decade of searching, we were able to de determine the fate of all 937 passengers on board the St. Louis. And much to our surprise, the majority of St. Louis passengers survived the war. It was always believed, even by those who survived, who thought they were the lucky few, that um, the majority were killed. But in fact, the majority survived. And that is, why is that? It's because, remember earlier, I said most of the passengers had waiting numbers to get into the United States. So their waiting numbers began to come up in, um, in the late you know, 1940, 41, 42, and were able to get out of Europe. And that's how they uh, survived. But to me, that does not diminish the tragedy. It accentuates the tragedy. Because there were those with waiting numbers who were Maybe their waiting numbers were coming up as they were on a train to Auschwitz and Sobobor to be gassed. This could have been a great rescue story on the part of the United States government with a little more flexibility, a little less anti-Semitism in the State Department at the time. Because as I said, mo they could have all been rescued. It was a matter of letting them in um, a little bit early. And 
Now, keep in mind to understand the context of the time. This was the de Depression in 1939. Anti-Semitism was at its height in the United States at the time. And there was a fear of refugees, a fear that unfortunately has not gone away. And the idea that the St. Louis passengers would have been a public, a public burden on the United States. Th this group of this particular group of refugees, I wouldn't say they were wealthy, but they were very, it was a very educated group of uh, people who were on the St. Louis. Um, a number of you know, professors, musicians, businessmen. Uh, there was um, one couple who themselves were very musical who ended up being gassed at Auschwitz. Uh, their name is uh, Leon and Johanna Joel. They had a great nephew who's very musical. You may have heard of him, Billy Joel. Billy Joel's great aunt and uncle were on, passengers on the St. Louis. Um, there was a relative by marriage of um, Dr. Ruth, Ruth Westheimer. His name was Westheimer. Um, you remember these are, there was a relative by marriage of Henry Kissinger on the St. Louis. Remember these are German Jewish uh, families who were very educated. It was a great loss to the United States, not to speak of the incredible loss of the St. Louis uh, of these individuals. 254 St. Louis passengers did not survive the war. Uh, it was an, uh, just a, a very senseless, senseless loss. They all could have survived. And we at the Holocaust Museum, again, did this project. In doing this project, we hope that we have given these refugees, those who survived and those who were killed, their final memorial. I have a lot more to say, but I don't have time. But maybe it can come through uh, if there are any um, questions. Thank you. So first of all, I just want to thank Dr. Miller for being here, as well as Jane Keeble, uh, who was on the St. Louis. Thank you guys so much for being here. Um, and I want to open it up now to questions. We have lots of time, and I think uh, either for Dr. Miller or for Ms. Keeble, um, any questions that you want to ask on this topic? Yes, I would be curious about the captain. What was his fate when he got back? Since oh. he was so, um, the napkin? Oh, the captain. captain. I said the napkin phone. Never mind. <laughs> I was, um, yes, that's a great question about Captain Schroeder. Now, Captain Schroeder, as far, as far as we know, was not persecuted for what he did because he did try to, it was very clear that he tried to rescue these Jews. He was involved with the Joint Distribution Committee to make sure the passengers disembarked in safety. Um, he went off course even by going to Miami Beach. And he even came up with a plan that he didn't do, but he considered setting, uh, going to the coast of England and setting fire to the ship so there'd have to be a rescue. He really tr tried to rescue the St. Louis passengers. This, he was on the older side. This was his last voyage. Um, after the war, there were a number of St. Louis passengers who made contact with him and helped actually support him till he died in 1958. Uh, again, he wasn't persecuted, but he died rather uh, you know, unknown except to the St. Louis passengers. Uh, the West German government around 15 years ago sort of rehabilitated him posthumously, and a number of St. Louis passengers went to Israel to Yad Vashem and had him recognized as a righteous Gentile, as a rescuer of Jews for what he tried to do. And, his, um, and a tree is planted for him. I saw it at, at, at Yad Vashem. So that's, you know, the passengers knew that he was, uh, that he tried to rescue them, but he was going against really the, the, the American government. No, my question was the German government, the German government not. He wasn't persecuted, but he sort of went into retirement. I don't know the details of if it was a forced retirement or not. Um, and he just lived out, he, he died in 1940, excuse me, in 1958. But every passenger um, who was old enough to remember to a person talks about Captain Schroeder very, very lovingly. Am I calling? Oh. The people in the State Department at the time who had influence to stop. Right. The, at the State Department, uh, with well, the Secretary of the State at the time was Cordell Hull, and um, who was, has a record, and not a sympathetic record to refugees. Um, and the person in charge of the visa division who sent the telegram back to the St. Louis. Uh, saying that they would have to leave American waters, that they'd have to wait their turn, was a man named uh, a initials A.M. Warren. I, 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 I just want to stress so people understand the historical context at the time, which, in, which is just explaining what happened, not justifying what happened, was uh, the State Department at the time was 
a bastion of uh, not just xenophobia, but specifically anti-Semitism. Um, President Roosevelt now could have issued an executive order to let the St. Louis passengers in. Um, in terms of law, legal, there was, as I said, the quota was filled for Germany. There was no mechanism for them to be let in without an executive order. And had President Roosevelt decided to make this executive order, issue an executive order, it would have had three, let's say, downsides. Um, one, it may have been at the expense, it probably would have been at the expense of other passengers with waiting numbers who were in Cuba or somewhere else who were waiting to get in. Sort of, they were, people were cutting ahead of them, so to speak. Um, it would have encouraged perhaps other ships to try to circumvent the system and come into the United States. And three, it would have triggered a re reaction from the already very strong anti-immigrant, xenophobic, anti um interventionist lobby. President Roosevelt eventually knew he would have to go to war, and he was trying to fight the, you could say, the right wing uh, uh, lobby, and this would not help by bringing in the, the St. Louis passengers. Uh, also, President Roosevelt was a very good politician. You don't be, you're not elected for terms president from being a bad politician. The St. Louis happens in 1939. That ends in a nine. That means the next year ends in a zero. It was an election year. Um, to be blunt, pre the President Roosevelt had the Jewish vote in any case. There was no political benefit for letting the St. Louis passengers in from a political point of view. Again, I'm not talking about ethical or anything, just from a political point of view in terms of real politics. Now, one could argue that the other side is that President Roosevelt, when he wanted to do something, was somewhat outrageous. For example, uh, trying to pack the Supreme Court, which I'm sure many of you learned about in American history, trying to add number to the number nine to make it to make to have more justices on the court to enact uh, or to approve new, new Deal policies. I mean, that, that's outrageous, but he, he tried to do it. So some people said he should have been outrageous in the case of the uh, St. Louis passengers. So um, remember, there's always text and there's context. The text is that these St. Louis passengers were sent away, many of them to their death. The context is the bigger uh, political context. So it was certainly. Uh, it was not courageous of President Roosevelt or the State Department not to let in the passengers, but in a contextual sense, it made sense historically. It was uh, it was under uh, you know understandable. So, but for me, the I don't want to use the word villain, but the, the you asked about the State Department, rightfully so. But the the real question is President Roosevelt, who's such a strong four-term elected president. Hello, my, my name is Ali. Hi, I Ali. have a question. Except St. Louis, there is there are there were aren't other cities to embark this refugee and not to return back to their country? Could there are other cities to embark these refugees? There were other cities except St. Louis. Ah, could they have gone to other Yeah. Yeah, well, um, there was talk on the ship um, of trying to get in, go to South America, Dominican Republic. Um, Canada, which Canada would not have let them in. Canada had a m worse record than the United States. Um, but there was only, Captain Schroeder just did not think that these countries would allow them in. And there was only so much fuel and water, you know, and food on the ship. So he went, he s sailed back across the Atlantic hoping for the best, which he, they thought happened when the Joint Distribution Committee brokered this deal, allowing them to disembark in, and, and be in cities, uh, countries other than Germany. Um, so he, rather than trying to go to other cities, he contacted the the Joint Distribution Committee, which at the time worked. But of course, it, you know, it didn't work. Hi. Um, where did those passengers go initially when they were brought into uh, the countries of France and England. Okay, so yeah, so they disembarked in Antwerp. They were met by immigration officials and officials of the highest, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, and they were divided between the four countries. Now, these four countries, and they had to fill out a questionnaire, and uh, on the questionnaire it didn't say where do you want to go, but it did ask where they had relatives, um, but it didn't, we don't know how, first of all, as I mentioned earlier, why was that a certain passenger was sent to Holland? Why a certain passenger was sent to England? And you would think, well, wouldn't they all want to go to England? Because England wasn't under the Nazi rule. But in 1939, none of the countries were under the Nazi rule. I know a number of passengers who wanted to go to Holland because Dutch was the closest to German. 
and they didn't know English. They didn't want to go to England. A number of them knew French. They wanted to go to, to um, France. Um, so in terms, I'll start with England because it's very interesting. Though they were obviously the safest, um, though um, many of the St. Louis passengers who went to England, and most of them were in London, were then interned by the British in, re in refugee camps because they were considered to be enemy aliens. They were considered to be Germans, even though in Germany they were stripped of citizenship and were only considered to be Jewish. Uh, so the, the passengers in England did not have it very easily, but of course it was the best place to be in, in, in retrospect. Um, in Holland, France, and Belgium, most of the passengers settled in the larger cities, at least initially, waiting for their waiting numbers to come up. And they were in constant contact with their, the American uh, embassy or American consulates. And again, this was without any electronic media. It really meant going to the consulates every day. So they wanted to be in the big cities close to where there was at least a consulate. But as the years, as the years went on, uh, many of the passengers themselves went into hiding because the deportations were beginning. In France, there was an organization called the OSE, which was a, a Jewish children's aid organization that took the children and put them in group homes to try to uh, keep them together for their morale, to teach them a trade. And um, one of the, uh, just going back here, Sorry about this. Uh, the children's picture. The, uh, the boy, uh, second from the left, his name is Herb Carliner. He, when he was in a children's home, he learned to be a baker. And he survived the war and opened, he went to Miami Beach. And he uh, became a very well-known uh, baker entrepreneur in Miami Beach. But he learned this while in hiding. He was one of the lucky ones uh, who survived. Um, so initially, the, the the passengers, to answer your questions, were in the big cities. And we have addresses for them. Some of them even had telephones. But as the years went on, they started to uh, go into hiding, either in their own initiative or um, they were taken care of by the Jewish community, particularly in France. But again, each case is different. I don't have time to give you each case, but I'm giving you in broad, in broad strokes. But the idea was to be near an American consulate, to have contact so you'll know when your waiting number came up to, to get out. How did the, the, the passengers of the St. Louis come to, to board the St. Louis? Was there, was there an organizer for this trip? Did they know each other, or was it just no, private no. individuals? It was private individuals. I don't know if Jane knows in terms of how families got to the St. Like, sailed on the St. Louis. Did they, they bought tickets just like they? Yeah, it was done individually. Yes, individually. And I think that we, we had no relatives, but well, there was one lady who was who we knew my parents still. Uh, but that was not uh, from a different city altogether. Right, there were a number of ships. These were cruise ships. <laughs> and you bought a ticket. Right. You bought a ticket. It was not really yeah. through the organized Jewish community. And there were it was random. Some people bought it, you know got to St. Louis. As I said, they were considered the lucky ones. Um, we met a number of people over the years who uh, bought tickets for the St. Louis, but at the last time backed out. For, for some reason, they weren't ready to leave Germany yet. They ended up being the lucky ones. I mean, you were, ah, so Jane was also at the uh, Jose home in France as well. Oh, of course it was. Yeah. Should I repeat it? Yes. I was at the Jose home that uh, Mr. Rillamelch mentioned before. Yes. Um, yeah, with that's the a photo from here. You can see it says Jose on the banner there. Right. Right. Some of them, again, survived in the Jose. These homes saved the children's lives, but not all, as in the case of Horace Rodholtz. And when did you come to the United States? What? 1940. 1940. January, oh. 1940. So your number we came up. Lucky, yes. Your, we, yep. Our quota number came up very quickly in right. France. Yep. It's a case in right here. Who's the call? Do you want to call on people? Or do you want me to? Uh, 
Don't take my picture. Take the young people. Uh, the question I just want to ask about Eleanor Roosevelt. Right. I had read about her that she tried very hard to influence her husband to change his mind. Is that true? I, I mean, don't know. I read... I've, 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 I've heard the same thing. There are, uh, at the time, there's no documentation. There are not, there's a lot of stories about how she tried to um, she prevailed on him, and specifically in the case of the St. Louis. I, I, I don't know. I mean, probably, but I, we, we don't know that. There was a lot said by Eleanor Roosevelt after the war about refugees. And then she, in fact, went to um, even to Israel, to youth Aliyah villages. But at the time, we don't know about these. But Jane, do you? Wait, can you give Jane? Give the microphone. The children on the ship sent uh, a telegram to Mrs. Roosevelt to ask to be admitted. She never answered. So maybe that helps you with that. Yeah, Thank you. all right. Just make you feel better, but that, that, that was the good, yes. Yeah, my, uh, my question is, uh, how long did this project uh, take you from start to finish? It was um, about a decade, from start to really finish, till we verified every story. It was about a decade. Um, keep in mind, this was without social media, although, although um, while it's a, certainly a blessing um, you know, to have social media, we still would have had to done a lot of what we did. You still, for those of you who are history majors, you still have to go to libraries and archives. It can't all be done um, um, online. So it took, it probably would have taken shorter with social media, but it took around a decade. Uh, it took around seven years till we were pretty confident that we could say we accounted for the fate of every passenger, but we had a few years of, uh, of verification, maybe two years of verification. Keep in mind, no social media, and also, this I wasn't doing this full time. It was part of my job, but it wasn't all that I, uh, you know, that I did, and I did it with a partner, with a, my colleague Sarah Ogilvy, and with a lot of help from people all over the world. But it was about uh, close to a, uh, a a decade. How how do you feel now that uh, probably somebody could Google uh, the St. Louis passengers and have? have the list in about 0 .0023 seconds. I, I feel good about it, but they would still not have, know what happened right. to them one by right. one. Right, we, we had a paper list, we had a paper list. Um, but look, there was, there's a passenger, there was a passenger on the St. Louis named Fritz Weigenthal, the very last one alphabetically, starts with the ZW. Um, till this day, he sort of haunts us, because over the years, uh, we found around five different people who somehow were related to him, uh, who gave a, differ a differing story of how, of, that he didn't survive, but they were all differing, differing stories. Um, and at the time, when Google, in fact, I first heard about Google, go to Google somebody through this project, somebody said to me, I forgot what year it was, did you Google the passengers? I didn't know what they were talking about. <laughs> and this wasn't that long ago, believe it or not. And I Googled Zweigenthal, and they were like, we found four Zweigenthals in the world, and none of them knew who Fritz Zweigenthal um, was. And it's still, if you Google Zweigenthal, aside from our research, it's still the same. So um, it, it, you know, it's, it, it's difficult. We have time for like one or two more questions uh, for Dr. Miller or for uh, Ms. Keeble. Anyone? Got the mic? There's another. When is the last time that you have the, found the new, uh, refugees? Do you find any late, lately refugees? Well, I'll tell you, um, first of all, we continue to get information about St. Louis passengers. People contact us um, all the time via um, our website. Sometimes it's information we knew. Sometimes it's information we didn't know. Um, but I'll just tell you, the last uh, St. Louis passenger we, we we, we found, her name was um, uh, Rosalie Moser, um, and which was confusing because there were a few people named Moser on the St. Louis, um, but there was a couple, Rosalie and Edmund Moser, who were on the St. Louis. Uh, they were missing passengers. Uh, however, we found that her, her husband, Edmund, we found his shipping record that he came to the United States in 1947. So somehow he must have survived, but there was no shipping record at the National Archives for her. At, we went back to the New York Public Library, and we had a document saying that he settled in New York City. 
So we went to the Board of Health Records of New York City that has a record of anyone who died in a hospital in New York City. And Edmund Moser died in 1948. So I said to myself, if he died in 1948, then uh, he must have left some type of will. So I went to the um, Manhattan Municipal Archives on Chambers Street, and um, there was no will by, uh, left by an Edmund Moser who died in 1948, which made me think that you know, his wife, something happened to her in Europe. They didn't have kids, and something happened to her in Europe that he didn't leave a will. And it's a very circuitous story. We ended up looking at hospital records from the south of France that Rosalie Moser died in surgery in 1943. Sort of a very inglorious end to our, that was the last passenger that, that, um, uh, that we found. Um, but we're constantly you know, getting, getting information. One of this Fritz Weigenthal, um, we thought we had exhausted all our leads and then we found that he had a brother who was a twin brother who lived in the Bronx. And we found that out very late in the game, but he had already died. But the twin brother had left testimony in Israel that Fritz Weigenthal was killed in Auschwitz, but there was no record. You can't go by testimony if, if there's no record. It's, so we wanted to learn more about this twin brother who lived in the Bronx. Um, so through, we called all the sem Jewish cemeteries and we found one where he was buried. And it, uh, we asked, does he have any next of kin? And they said, no, but his wife has a sister in Manhattan. We called the sister in Manhattan. This is the sister-in-law of the twin brother of Fritz Weigenthal. And she was very suspicious, why are we calling her? But she didn't know even that her brother-in-law in the Bronx had a brother, because he didn't talk about the Holocaust. So, um, you know, the more we know, there was also the more uncertainties. But for most of the passengers, we were able to get very thorough documentation that backed up every piece of testimony uh, you know, that, that we got. But we're always looking for information. It'll really never, never, never end. I was wondering, uh, Ms. Kibble, if you could maybe talk about um particular memory that's distinct or something that we as a, a group or as a community uh, can take away from this, if you wouldn't mind. Okay. No, yes, if you have your company. Well, I'm the only one from my family who survived. Uh, so sometimes I wish they were around so I could remember some more. So you had a sister uh, and your parents, yes, were I had a sister, a younger sister, my parents. We were together on the trip. And we went to France. My father decided not to put down he wants to go wherever. Most people wanted to go to England because of the language. And he just left it out. So we were sent to France. We were lucky. And uh, I had made a very... And I had made friends on the ship. They were uh, youngsters my own age, and we were, got very close. And uh, one of them went to France, too, and we were in the Jose home together, and, which was a very pleasant interlude for me, at least. Uh, my parents, German parents, are very strict. And we weren't told anything. We weren't participating in anything. But the Jose home was led by a educator, it was Papanek, Ernest Papanek. And he let us all participate in programs. We had a voice, and that was a good thing for me. I came into my own. And uh, when we came to America in January 1940, we moved to Kew Gardens not to Washington Heights. <laughs> Which Kew Gardens was also Kew a center Gardens, of German yeah. Jewish refugees. And I still lived there. And I got married and I had two children, two boys. There were and one grandchild and one great grandchild. <laughs> yes. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so again, thank you all for coming. Um, if you're interested, this is the book that Dr. Miller and his colleague uh, Sarah Ogilvie wrote on this topic. Um, I know my students have seen copies of this book, but um, it's available in libraries, bookstores, etc. All the proceeds from the book go to the Holocaust Museum. Yeah. 
And it's really, um, I, in terms of what was said at the beginning of Dr. Miller's uh, talk about, um, and as well as what uh, Professor Kubowitz said, thank you, sorry about that. Um, just the idea of like humanizing these stories and remembering that these are not numbers, but these are actual human people with their own families and histories behind them and in front of them. I think we should always remember that. So thank you all. Thank you.